Thank you for coming. I call this uh, hearing of the Federal Spending Oversight Subcommittee to order. Almost 17 years ago, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan to topple the Taliban regime to provide sa that provided safe harbor to perpetrators of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. I think that was the right thing to do at the time, but I think we've simply stayed too long. This is the longest military engagement in U.S. history. We've already been there seven years longer than the Soviets, and their occupation is often characterized as a failure, their Vietnam. Instead of learning from their experience, we seem to want to duplicate it. We have occupied their old bases, we're trying to build the same kind of infrastructure, and we are fighting the same kind of guerrilla force. What is more troubling is that some talk about never coming home. We are told our mission there is vital and that we are making a stable country in the region which will pay a peace dividend even if we have to stay 50 years, 50 years. Recently, Secretary Pompeo admitted there is not a military solution to the Afghan war. And yet this administration just upped our troop numbers. We build dams and electric transmission lines and the Taliban blow them up or worse, take them over and sell the power back to the Afghan people. And by the way, while we are building infrastructure there, our infrastructure at home is aging and crumbling. The country isn't safe. You can't even leave the embassy. Most of the time, our personnel can't even visit many of the infrastructure projects we pay for. Let me repeat that. We cannot even visit many of the projects we are paying for. We have an opium problem there. We have an opium problem here. And despite spending over $8 billion in Afghanistan, they're still the leading producer of poppies as a uh, origin of heroin for the world. It's just insane. To top it all off, we're spending over $40 billion each year for this. So this hearing is to really take a deeper dive into examine that spending. We have the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction here today to talk about some of his great work exposing things like the $42 million natural gas gas station, the $60 million power transmission system that doesn't work, buildings that melt in the rain, and the $80 million consulate up in Mazar Sharif that was never occupied because it was not secure. We want to hear about their ongoing corruption review as well. Our second panel will be staffed from the subcommittee who recently returned from an oversight trip to Kabul. As mind-boggling as the way seems back here in Washington, I understand from them it's all the more galling when you were there on the ground. I've made it no secret, I think we should come home. I think we went in for the right reasons, but we stayed too long. It isn't our job to build countries, and frankly, I think we do a poor job of it. If you talk to our soldiers, I think they'll tell you that's not why they enlisted. I think we anger as many people as we help, and that we should make the taxpayers, and, and that that also makes the taxpayers back home angry. With that, I'll recognize Ranking Member Peters for his opening statement. Senator Peters. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and I'd like to join you in welcoming Inspector General Sopko and Ms. Miller to the uh, subcommittee. I look forward uh, to both of your testimony. Today's uh, hearing is notable, not just because of its uh, important topic, reconstruction spending in Afghanistan, but also because of its venue. Uh, although the Senate regularly holds hearings related to our nation's efforts in Afghanistan, until now those hearings have generally been held uh, before the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Service Relations Committee. So it's rare for our oversight committee to focus on spending in Afghanistan, uh, but I do think uh, we should. In the 17 years since uh, September 11th, the American taxpayer has been asked to bankroll hundreds of billions of dollars of spending on combat, relief, and reconstruction in Afghanistan. Our total bill is quickly approaching $900 billion, not counting uh, that what we spend here at home treating and caring for our veterans. More than $125 billion has been spent on relief and reconstruction alone. And even accounting for inflation, that's more than we spent on the Marshall Plan to rebuild Western Europe in the aftermath of World War II. Frankly, calling it reconstruction is uh, somewhat of a misnomer. Uh, much of our work in Afghanistan is construction, building infrastructure and capacity where currently none exists. After 17 years and hundreds of billions of dollars, it's more than fair for taxpayers to ask, is it worth it? Uh, what is the return on our investment? Are we throwing good money after bad? And why are we spending hundreds of billions of dollars on infrastructure thousands of miles away when our own roads and bridges are crumbling right outside our doors? Uh, what do I tell the people of Flint, Michigan, who ask me, why are, are, are my taxes paying for clean water and cobble when I don't have clean water in my own home here in Flint? 
Uh, these are important questions and very hard ones. Partly there are policy questions. Uh, put simply, the money we spend in Afghanistan is intended to promote our national security. And thanks to the incredible dedication and sacrifice of our service members, frontline civilians and their families, we have been successful in driving al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan and uh, uh, denying safe haven to transnational terrorists. We have made progress in democracy and development and helping to strengthen Afghan institutions. There are more roads, more electrical lines, literacy is up, and infant mortality is down. And yet, Afghanistan is not secure. We are constantly warned that chaos will follow a precipitous withdrawal of our forces and funding, and every year we add tens of billions of dollars to the bill. Taxpayers are growing weary. My constituents tell me we can't aff afford to write a blank check. To draw America's longest war to a successful conclusion, we must empower Afghans to achieve and sustain the peace. We must responsibly reduce our spending as we continue to transition military and governing capacity to Afghans. How we achieve that is uh, as much about process as it is policy. The right policies don't ensure success on their own, in fact, far from it. When the money we spend in Afghanistan is wasted, stolen, or ends up in the hands of the very enemies we seek to defeat, it undermines our policy, however well intended. And I hope that's what we focus on here today. How do we prevent waste, fraud, and abuse from our spending in Afghanistan? How do we ensure that each dollar is put to its highest and best use? How do we track it? How do we measure its effectiveness? Are the right oversight structures in place to provide us with the information that we need to make the tough decisions? And I know from my own visit to Afghanistan and from the visit made by our staffs last month, our security posture severely limits the ability of Americans to work outside of the wire. In many cases, American aid workers and auditors uh, can't even visit the projects that our taxpayers fund. What oversight options, if any, do we have in that kind of security environment? So I'm grateful to be here to hear from Mr. Sopko and Ms. Miller, who have years of experience working on these questions inside and outside of Afghanistan. Between them, they can speak to the challenge of conducting reconstruction programs and the challenge of auditing and overseeing these programs. And I certainly thank you for your service and thank you for being here today. Members of this subcommittee have a wide range of views about our nation's involvement in Afghanistan, but whatever your views, our success depends on spending money effectively, even as we seek to reduce our overall expenditures. Waste fuels corruption, undermines the institutions in Afghanistan that we seek to empower, and breaks faith with the American taxpayer. I hope today's hearing will help address these issues and send a strong message that Congress's role doesn't end when we pass a budget and write a check. We have an obligation to follow the money and ask the tough questions. I thank you and yield back. Thank you, Senator Peters. With that, I'll begin with our witness opening statements. I'll remind the witnesses that their already submitted and written testimony will be included in the record and to keep your remarks to five minutes. Our first witness is Special Invest Inspector General John Sopko of the Office of the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. For those of you who are unaware, Special Inspector General Sopko worked for the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations from 1982 to 1997. He assumed his role as a Special Inspector General in July of 2012. He has an illustrious resume with more than 30 years of experience in oversight and investigations as a prosecutor, congressional counsel, and senior federal government advisor. He holds a bachelor a bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a JD from Case Western University Law School. Special Invest Inspector General Sopko, welcome back to the HISGAC hearing room, and I recognize you for your opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Paul, Ranking Member Peters, and other members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to appear before the subcommittee to discuss our oversight work in Afghanistan and the status of reconstruction there. Let me express my appreciation for the attention the committee has paid to SIGAR's work. As you know, Mr. Chairman, both you and Senator Lankford have highlighted many of SIGAR's findings in your reports on government waste. And Senator McCaskill's recent report, entitled Fast Cars, Easy Money, highlighted gross mismanagement of taxpayer dollars initially identified by a SIGAR audit. Likewise, I appreciate that the majority and minority staff of the committee took the time to learn about our work firsthand during their recent travel to Afghanistan. 
Now, this committee, as you well know, is tasked with, quote, studying the efficiency, economy, and effectiveness of agencies and departments of the government, unquote. SIGAR is charged with a similar requirement, to look at all federal entities involved in Afghanistan reconstruction. We are the only Office of Inspector General authorized to examine all aspects of reconstruction regardless of the department or agency involved, including U.S. funds contributed to international organizations for Afghanistan. Now that is critical, especially critical today, because reconstruction in Afghanistan has involved many U.S. foreign and multinational agencies conducting an immense, immensely wide range of activities, including building the Afghan security force, undertaking efforts to improve education and health care of the Afghan people, fighting corruption, fighting the narcotics trade, and developing the Afghan economy. We have seen much good work done, but we have also reported on far too many instances of poor planning, sloppy execution, theft, corruption, and a lack of accountability. Some of the most egregious examples SIGAR has identified include DOD's purchase of nearly a half billion dollars worth of secondhand airplanes from Italy that were unusable and later sold as scrap. The construction of an Afghan security forces training facility that literally melted in the rain. Numerous schools, clinics, roads, and other infrastructure built dangerously unsound and with little, if any, concern for the costs of supplying and sustaining them. And a failed $8.7 billion counter-narcotics effort in a country where poppy cultivation increased by 63% last year alone. Common problems we have identified include touting dollars spent as a metric of success and counting outputs like training courses held rather than outcomes of activities such as whether those courses actually improved performance. Poor co coordination and parochialism among U.S. and foreign agencies rather than an integrated whole of government approach. Projects and programs developed without a metric to assess them. A failure to take into account the Afghans' ability to sustain these projects and a persistent lack of accountability for poor for performance, whether by firms or individuals. Also a loss of institutional memory due to constant personnel rotations and illegal acts like soliciting bribes, taking kickbacks, or stealing money. Now, Afghanistan reconstruction is a work in progress, and as we all recognize, slow progress at that. Results to date have been decidedly mixed, but there has been progress as noted by the members, including improvements in health and educational outcomes for the Afghan people. While great obstacles remain, I believe that an effective reconstruction effort in Afghanistan can support this administration's policy that the, con the country must never again be a launching pad for terrorist activity. But to succeed, our government must do a better job of planning, overseeing, monitoring, and imposing accountability for misconduct and incompetence. SIGAR, as you well know, does not make or weigh in on national policy. As an inspector general, we do process. We look at the process. But as long as reconstruction efforts continue, we will persist in our efforts to improve the work by presenting the facts as we find them and making recommendations where appropriate. Thank you, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you for your testimony. Our next witness is Ms. Laurel E. Miller. Ms. Miller is a senior political scientist at RAND Corporation. She served as the acting special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan at the U.S. Department of State, and prior to that, principal deputy special representative. She has participated in national security and foreign policy studies on, sub on subjects ranging from democratization to conflict resolution to institution building in weak states. Ms. Miller holds an AB from Princeton and a JD from the University of Chicago. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Miller. Good afternoon, Chairman Paul, Ranking Member Peters, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, and thank you for having me here today. 
I've been asked to address the effectiveness of U.S. spending in Afghanistan. This has two main components, efficiency of how the dollars are spent, as Mr. Sopko was addressing, and impact of the spending on achieving policy goals. And I'll focus mostly on the latter, covering three main points. First, the motivation behind U.S. spending, why we're doing it. Second, the results achieved. And third, uh, I'd like to propose a path forward towards reducing the U.S. commitment while mitigating risk. First, the rationale for U.S. spending stems from the 2001 invasion. The U.S. ousted the Taliban regime not to improve conditions in Afghanistan for Afghans, but to pursue U.S. national security interests in destroying al-Qaeda and, because it had provided safe haven for al-Qaeda, the Taliban. The driving imperative of U.S. strategy since has been to prevent al-Qaeda and other international terrorist groups from regaining or gaining a foothold in Afghanistan and to prevent the return of Taliban rule. <clears throat> but the invasion created a vacuum, which then had to be filled by establishing a new government and by developing that government's capabilities to provide the country's security and to work with the United States in denying space to terrorist groups. So the theory behind using taxpayer dollars to promote Afghan economic and human development, to improve public services, and to build institutional capabilities is that making those kinds of improvements would create a stable political and security environment. The U.S. has long recognized that it cannot only battle its way to stability in Afghanistan. Although in certain areas the improvements sought have been achieved, on the whole, neither political nor security conditions in Afghanistan are more stable now than they were prior to the surge in troops and spending a decade ago. In other words, there are specific spending objectives that have been achieved, but the ultimate purpose, a stable and self-sustaining Afghanistan, has not yet been fulfilled. One possible explanation is that the theory I described of how this spending works is mistaken. One certain explanation is that achieving the kinds of impact that I've outlined in a war-torn country anywhere in the world is exceedingly difficult. For instance, creating from scratch security institutions can't be achieved through quick-fix technical measures, uh, but instead require broad-based improvements in governance, uh, quality, and in changes in societal norms. So if the main stability goals haven't been achieved, then the question comes, what results have been produced? One way to answer that is to look at particular projects and whether they were competently executed, whether they produced the desired outputs. But using a wider lens, it's also possible to answer in terms of the impact of the totality of aid on Afghan society. U.S. assistance has clearly produced some positive development outcomes, which have no doubt improved the lives of many Afghans. A variety of statistical indicators show that health, education, access to information, other facets of life have improved significantly, and that's a tribute to U.S. spending in the country. One example is the ninefold increase in the number of Afghan children in school, which is an important investment in future generations. There is, however, some doubt about the sustainability of these outcomes, and the economic picture in Afghanistan has begun to deteriorate together with security conditions. In analyzing these results and the impact they've had on achieving policy goals, it's also important to consider how much better could be expected. It's important to note that the Afghan context is exceptionally challenging. It's still one of the world's poorest countries. It's arid, landlocked historically has attracted interference by neighbors and regional powers, and it suffered decades of damaging conflict. It can hardly be surprising that implementing assistance programs there is extraordinarily difficult. In realistically setting expectations for efficiency and impact, the significant limitations imposed by conditions in Afghanistan should be appreciated. So the crucial question comes back to one of policy. To what extent do U.S. national security interests justify continuing to spend assistance dollars while accepting that, inevitably, there will be leakages, losses, and imperfections? Answering that question should take into account that the Afghan government and security forces the U.S. has established in their current forms are now dependent on that financing. 
At the extreme end of a range of options, rapid elimination of U.S. assistance would likely lead to a steep downward slide of security and political stability. So to conclude, I would say in my judgment, U.S. national security interests could best be advanced by mounting a robust diplomatic initiative to negotiate a settlement of the conflict that would fold the Taliban into Afghan politics, enable the United States to narrow its security mission to focus on counterterrorism, and set the conditions for normalizing the scale of U.S. assistance. Current U.S. policy nominally acknowledges the need ultimately for a negotiated settlement, but actual policy execution is still very heavily dominated by the U.S. military effort. A concerted, prioritized initiative to negotiate would be a major foreign policy undertaking, requiring both clear political backing and substantial diplomatic muscle. As yet, those requirements do not appear to exist. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And if Senator Peters is okay with this, I'd like to encourage participation. And so I'm going to skip myself, Senator Peters, and go to Senator McGaskill unless you have a complaint. No, is that I'm good? Afraid. All right. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing, and thank you for um, uh, deferring your questioning. Um, I wish, John, I could say to you that um, it looks like you're about out of work, <laughs> but we've been at this a long, long time. Um, I got two parts of this I want to talk about. The first part, briefly, I think it's helpful for the committee record to get some sense of what has happened in regards to infrastructure projects. And correct me if there's anything I'm saying, John, here that's wrong, but I believe what the genesis of this was, it all started with SERP money in Iraq. It started with walking around money for sergeants and command leaders to give storekeepers money for a broken window, to try to win the hearts and minds in a counterinsurgency fight. Well, before you know it, in about 14 armed services hearings later, we realized this had morphed into a large infrastructure situation where all of a sudden you had a mixture of roles between USAID and DOD as to who was responsible for building the infrastructure. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, that's correct. We, we've discussed it before about the conflict between some of the agencies. So you had the DOD deciding they were going to start building things like highways and they were going to start building things like health centers. And all of that went terribly awry in Iraq. So you would think we would have lessons learned when we moved into Afghanistan. But once again, we had an Afghanistan infrastructure fund within the Department of Defense budget. Now, I worked many years getting that to be gone. And am I correct now that the AIF is actually gone and the money that is currently being spent on infrastructure is only being done by USAID? Senator, let me just ask my staff. I think there still may be some residual funds there, but let me just check. Is there still residual? Residual, but no new projects have been begun, have been started with those funds in the last several years, correct? Not that we know of. Yeah. Okay. So um, a little bit of progress. At least there's an acknowledgement that we shouldn't be having the military decide about natural gas, gas stations in a country where there are no cars that run on natural gas. Um, the main question I'd like to ask you now, Inspector General, about um, Afghanistan, whether we're talking about the electric grid that, or the dual fuel electric grid that never was oper operable, whether we're talking about the natural gas station, whether you're talking about the transmission project, whether you're talking about the highway that costs more to guard while we built it and there was no highway department in Afghanistan to maintain it, um, has, to your knowledge, has anybody been held accountable on those projects in terms of losing their jobs? Uh, no, no, Senator. No one's being held accountable. If there was anything that we could agree on, Mr. Chairman, would be I would love to partner with you and any of my colleagues on this committee or any other committee to speak with one voice that we are never going to stop some of this nonsense if the person who decided a natural gas gas station was a good idea. It never has consequences. Could I interject a question and ask John why no one's held accountable? It has to do with contractors. <laughs> I, I think it's contractors. It's also the system. And, and I would just add, Senator and Chairman Paul, many of the problems we see in Afghanistan are not unique to Afghanistan. The people we've sent to Afghanistan are not evil. They're not stupid. We gave our diplomats, our military, and our aid officials 
a box of broken tools. If you look at procurement, and I know Senator McCaskill, you and I have had this conversation, DOD procurement has been on the GAO high risk list Forever. since 1991, the first time they came out the high risk list, but it's not fixed. OPM and personnel management has not been fixed. We can't hire the right person fast enough and fire the wrong person fast enough. So you go through the list. These are problems that I'm certain the HHS IG or the VA IG or anyone else would come in and probably tell you they see the same problems here in the United States. It's exacerbated somewhat in DOD because of the contractor reliance and the contractor relationships that are built yeah, up. Absolutely correct. And so the, the second part of my um, time, I'd like to talk about the report that um, the minority staff of this committee um, put out. Um, and I would ask that the report of Fast Cars, Easy Money be put into the record of this hearing. Without objection. Um, and I have been assured by Secretary Mattis that I'm going to get some answers. But um, you, and you were correct in your opening statement, John, that the um, genesis of this report was, in fact, your audit work in this area where we discovered the legacy contract. The legacy contract is an effort to train Afghan personnel on how to do intelligence gathering. And it, it, it is um, hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent. Let me ask you first, were you able to find any metrics in your audit that showed that this was actually performing as advertised in terms of training Afghan personnel in appropriate intelligence gathering? Absolutely not. And um, as part of this, we discovered that a uh, somebody shopped this contract in DOD under a, uh, a BAA, which is a request for proposal that doesn't require competition. Basically, they pretzeled this proposal to get the contract through without competition, and that was primarily done by a subcontractor who got the majority of the money in the legacy contract in CC. And um, through the work of Cigar and the work of, the, of my staff, discovered that the United States of America has paid for Bentley's, for um, uh, Aston Martins, for Porsches, all on the taxpayer dime that the CEO and the COO are driving around the UK, along with employing their spouses at average salaries of around two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year. And it's my understanding that no work could be found that these spouses or significant others had ever done, correct? That is my knowledge. So um, that's what this report outlines. It is an egregious example of contracting gone amiss. And the whipped cream and cherry on top of this incredibly nasty Sunday is that NCC is still doing business with the United States of America. They are still an existing contractor with the U.S. as we speak. Uh, their lawyer, who also happens to be the lawyer for Michael Cohen, which is a little interesting, wrote me a letter and said, I need to quit bad-mouthing them. No chance. No chance am I going to quit bad-mouthing this com company until we get to the bottom of what happened. As I say, uh, Secretary Mattis has indicated that um, he is going to get to the bottom of it. He sent me a handwritten note after the last armed services hearing when I went off on this, and he says we're going we're to hold somebody accountable. I will hold my breath and hope that happens. In the meantime, I want to compliment the work of all the inspectors general. Um, when I first went to Iraq after I got elected and discovered that inspectors general within the military are not like inspectors general in the rest of the, uh, the government. The inspectors general in the military report to their commander. They have no obligation to report to the public or to Congress. They are really more about giving the commander information, and that's why Cigar and why the, the special inspector generals in places like Iraq and Af Afghanistan are so important. There have been attempts to undermine your work. We have tried to defend you and protect uh, the, the work that you do, but I want to compliment you on the record for and your and your great staff and all the auditors, especially those in theater that do uh, the really hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Explain that again. So inspector generals typically report to... Within the military. But let's say outside the military. The rest of the inspector generals report to... Us and to the public. The committee. They are not. They are not. Not to this committee, but to the public and to Congress. But and I got in a fight with the military when I first realized this because I was an auditor. I said, "Why are you calling them inspectors general within the military?" Because it looked like to me in Iraq when I discovered it looked like some of them were just covering their commanders. You know what? And they said, "Well, we had the name first. 
So you're going to have to rename everybody else before you rename us. So do you agree with this assessment, Mr. Sopko, that uh, the chain of command is different for the inspector generals in oh, DOD oh, than the oh. rest of government? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. What, what uh, Senator McCaskill's pointing out is that the, the inspector general concept goes back to the beginning of the Continental Congress. And that was uh, General, General Washington appointed the first IG. But they're service IGs. They report to the command and basically are the eyes and ears of the command and improve the structure. It's a good structure, but it's not the independent inspectors general that you have in all the departments. Well, my thought would be, Senator McCaskill, if, if you don't have legislation on this, I'd be interested in doing legislation where we change the line of command for inspector generals in we DOD. Have, there is a DOD IG that doesn't work within a command. In other words, we have the okay. Inspector General at DOD. But what I was taken aback when I went to Iraq and I thought, okay, I'm going to sit down with the Inspector General and find out what's going on in this unit because okay. I was looking at contracting. Then I discovered, oh, you aren't that kind of Inspector General. All right. I got you. Uh, Senator Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to follow up on that, although I'm almost in, inclined to yield my time since Senator McCaskill's on a roll. Um, Don't you have to draw down. Yeah, no, that's why I'm not yielding my time, Senator. Um, <laughs> you know, look, as a, I'm a former prosecutor, former U.S. attorney, and I'm, I'm just stunned that what I just heard, that, that n no one is being referred not to just be fired, but to go to prison on something like this. And, and is the, the chain of command, is it what we just heard, is that the reason why that there is no prosecutions going on here? Senator, there are some prosecutions, and I, I apologize if I misstated uh, that. Uh, we ourselves have the largest law enforcement presence in Afghanistan, U.S. law enforcement. We have indicted and convicted over 100 individuals. Okay. My staff has recovered over a billion dollars in fines and penalties. But what I think I was responding to, and again, I apologize if I misspoke, is that for the misdeeds, and it's not criminal, this is just incompetency, right. sloppiness, and whatever, no one gets fired. If you, if, if, you're, if you steal $20, uh, somebody will try to indict you. But if you just, through gross negligence, waste $150 million, like we saw in some of our cases, nobody gets fired by the Department of Defense or aid or state. That's what we're doing. Okay. All right. To follow that a little bit, is, you've mentioned that the, there is a significant problem with corruption in general. Is that coming from the other side? Is that coming from the Afghan government uh, and officials that you have to deal with in the re reconstruction effort? Oh, absolutely. The corruption, I mean, uh, Afghanistan is one of the most corrupt countries in the world, and it's been historically viewed that way. So you're dealing with a very corrupt regime uh, to start with. Now, it's changed, I think, to the better, and that's one of the improvements. With the national unity government under President Ghani and CEO Abdullah, they care about trying to fight this. But assume, sir, that it's almost like you're the mayor of Chicago in 1930. Every cop, every prosecutor, every judge has been pay paid for by organized crime. How do you start? And we've been helping. DOD has been trying to help, aid, and everybody else. But it's an immense task to turn that around. Is there anything that Congress, anything, any tools that we can do or give that would assist that you don't have now? Well, I, I raise it in my statement. The big issue we have has to do with security and our ability of not just us, but the Department of Justice attorneys who are over there right. who can help educate and mentor the prosecutors. They have a physical problem with getting out. They are faced with the same economic problem because of those charges that the State Department imposes on us. Maybe it costs more money for one of my people to travel three miles to the Afghan airport, international airport, than it does to fly home to Dulles. And that's a charge that the State Department is charging us. So that affects every civilian agency. So there are some things that I'm happy to discuss where you can help us because pretty soon it's going to be impossible financially for us to do oversight in Afghanistan. Well, that's where I was going next in, in the security. I take it that, that getting out among in the country to get into the places that you need to get is a major problem for security reasons. So let's just go there. You said you're happy to discuss. Tell us what we can do to help 
alleviate the security issues or at least alleviate the cost of the security? Well, the, the cost of the, the security is one I, I identify. It's the ICAST costs and also the travel costs. And I, I think somebody just needs to talk to the new Secretary of State and talk to him about these, these charges that they're imposing. The general security in Afghanistan has deteriorated. And there's, there's nothing you can legislate about that. But you can talk to the State Department about a policy that we have seen over the last few years, and this is meant, not meant as a criticism of uh, Professor Miller, who had nothing to do with the policy, but there has been a reluctance to risk, to taking a risk. People have thought you could do diplomacy and have thought in Maine State that you can do reconstruction risk-free. You can't. If you want to avoid all risk, then you might as well shut down the embassy and shut down my office and try to do it remotely from Dubai. And that has what has permeated the State Department. Now, I'm hoping with the new Secretary of State, I know there's a new ambassador in Afghanistan who appreciates that problem, who wants his people to get out, who wants the aid officials to get out to see those sites, but there has been this risk aversion. And that is something that is just killing us and killing our dip diplomats, and I don't mean physically, but killing their ability to work. How are you doing it? How are you getting out there? Well, we're trying to use satellites. We're trying to use Afghan civilians who work with us. We're trying to use every technique we can. But as your staff from the committee will tell you, you have to go out and kick the tire. You have to put eyes on the Marriott Hotel. You have to go see these facilities. So you have to take a calculated risk. What I am telling you, I've been doing this for six years. I've seen this over the last year. Nobody permits us to take that risk. And again, if we approach it that way, the bad guys have won because we never leave the embassy or I, rarely leave it. I agree. Well, I commend you for the work that you've done. I would like to take my remaining seconds, uh, Mr. Chairman, to commend my Alabama National Guard and the 1st Battalion of the 167th Infantry Regiment for all the work they've been doing. I help, I think, helping you and your security and contributing such a, uh, a great deal to the U.S. efforts transporting 18,000 passengers over thousands and thousands of miles. So just a plug for my guys. I, I, I will uh, definitely congratulate your guard. I actually sent a letter of, uh, uh, of congratulations to them. They did a wonderful job because they were supporting us on a lot of our moves, and they did a fantastic job. And that's what we really need. We need an MOU signed and approved by the State Department and DOD that where state can't provide the security, DOD will step in. It makes sense financially. They're there. They're very well trained. But we even had a reluctance by the State Department to allow DOD to protect us in doing our job. Well, that is something, Mr. Chairman, I think we should explore. Thank you. We're going to turn to Senator Peters here in a second, but I just wanted to interject one thing on your point is that you know, you can do these things, but the question is, yeah, you should have oversight, but there's also a question of uh, can we ever get to that point? So, for example, the gas station, I asked Mr. Sopko about the gas station. He said to see it, for an American to go see it, sure you can go see it. But you'd have to have a couple hundred troops and warships and all this. You basically are going into enemy territory. We're not talking about spending a thousand bucks to go look at it. We're talking about an enormous expense. So we're we the war the we're not winning the war necessarily. And I don't know. I think the whole it's not a question of for some it may be better oversight, but but some may be is it something we should continue to do at all, Senator Peters? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm going to want to ask some questions uh, related to that as far as just the overall metrics of, of how we measure success uh, in, in Afghanistan, to ask those bigger questions that you just uh, raised, Mr. Chairman. But before I get there, I, I, uh, Mr. Sepka, you mentioned it in your opening comments, too. It's an issue that just drives me crazy, uh, especially given what we're facing here in the United States with the uh, opioid uh, crisis. Uh, and I understand a lot of the opium from uh, Afghanistan doesn't come to the United States. It's in Europe and other places. But in a recent trip that I took to Afghanistan, I was told uh, it we're just a, uh, a illicit contract away from perhaps seeing an awful lot of Afghan opioids uh, getting into the United States as well. And yet, as you mentioned in your opening testimony, here is a situation where we have spent 
I think this is based on your most recent quarterly report. We've, we've spent $8.7 billion for counter-narcotics efforts since 2002, and what we've seen is the total area continues to increase for cultivation, and now production has reached an all-time high. What's going on after spending $8.7 billion? Well, um, our work has shown that the programs didn't work, and they weren't well-coordinated. And uh, first of all, I, 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 let me just premise this, that we understand it's difficult to fight narcotics. I mean, they've been doing it in Mexico for decades. They've been doing it in Colombia. When I first testified here for Senator Sam Nunn and for Carl Levin, we were looking at counter-narcotics programs in the Andean region in Colombia back in the mid-'80s. So it's a very difficult deal, un uh, uh, undertaking. So I understand that. But we will be issuing a lessons learned report. As a matter of fact, we've already issued three, but in another month, we're gonna issue one where we actually looked at our counter-narcotics programs for the last 17 years and tried to draw out best practices. And since it's, the report isn't out yet and it's still under review, I can't really go into the details. Happy to come back and brief you on that. But basically, we had a lot of programs, <laughs> but they were poorly coordinated and poorly executed. And so we are now faced with a situation, and again, I may show my age, Senator, I go back here to the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, which was the, created before Afghanistan, and I remember talking to uh, former Commissioner uh, Anslinger, and he said, look at these variables, look at price and purity. In this case, look at price, purity, and look at the amount under cultivation. Hectares under cultivation have skyrocketed. Opium produced skyrocketed. Exports skyrocketed. Price has decreased because there's just so much opium out there. We have interdicted more, but if you take all of the interdictions over the last 10 years in Afghanistan, they are equal to 0.05% of the production just for this year. Just let that sink in. Every interdiction we have done for the last 10 years is equal to 0.05% of the production just for this year, and next year will be a bigger crop. So we have to do something because the opium is funding the corruption, the opium is funding the terrorists, and if you want to do something about both of those, we have to come up with some programs and policies that actually work and commit ourselves to them. Thank you. Ms. Miller, I'd, I'd like to, to have you um, discuss a little bit about your, what you think would be the metrics that we would measure success uh, in Afghanistan. I think in your testimony, you talk about normalization to be able to stabilize that. And in your oral testimony, you talked about we still haven't re achieved political and security stability there. But as we are spending the amount of money that we are spending in Afghanistan, I would hope that there is a set of fairly objective metrics and not just measured in the outputs as we heard uh, in testimony as well. But what exactly, what does success mean in Afghanistan? How do we measure that? And where are we today in terms of those kinds of measurements in your estimation? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, first, if, just to add one word on the counter-narcotics issue, uh, you know, there may well have been problems with the process of how the assistance was delivered, coordination and such. I'm certain that there were. Um, but I don't think that's by any means the predominant reason for failure. The incentives driving narcotics production and trafficking in Afghanistan and the conflict dynamics that helped to perpetuate it are just far more powerful than U.S. spending in Afghanistan, than anything we could do through assistance programs there and counter narcotics programs. That's not to say we shouldn't improve efforts where we can, but I have no expectation that U.S. government programs in Afghanistan are going to materially address the narcotics problem there. Um, on the question of metrics of success, um, you know, I think there are uh, the, the the main metric of success should relate to the main reason why we're in Afghanistan, which is dealing with 
uh, our counterterrorism concerns in the in the region. And so uh, I think you could say that the fact that the U.S. has had considerable success in decimating Al Qaeda in the region is an out and out success in terms of what our original reasons were for invading the country. Um, the second key element is are we bringing stability and sustainable stability to the country in a way that will enable the United States to, uh, to uh, reduce its commitment, reduce its military presence, which is the, the much more expensive than any of the assistance spending in the country, uh, to normal levels uh, and a, a normalized assistance relationship with the country. And I think the, the success in that sense is only going to come through ending the conflict, uh, through achieving a political settlement that enables us to reduce our troop commitment in the country, essentially to withdraw most or all of our troops from the country, and to normalize our assistance levels. And until we do that, we may have achieved some intermediate levels of success on some of the more narrow objectives, but we won't really have succeeded in fulfilling our purpose in Afghanistan. Um, Mr. Sopka, you mentioned the half a billion dollars in cargo planes we bought from Italy and then I guess are being sold as scrap and that no one's really been held accountable for that, correct? That is correct. So this is somebody in purchasing at DOD who made the decision to buy the airplanes? Uh, that's correct. Okay. So um, when you do the analysis and you discover this and point out that this much money and this bad decision was made, uh, you tell us, you issue reports, do you get a time to specifically talk to commanders or people in the military about your reports? Yes, we do. And, we, and, and many times we do get very positive response on that. Uh, on the G222, which is that military plane, just so you know, we do have an open criminal investigation ongoing in that case. Okay, so there's a possibility that somebody not won't be fired, that someone actually committed malfeasance in it. But let's say there's an example, just X example, where it's just a bad decision. Uh, you do go to the military, and then if you indicate that this was just a terrible decision, that someone made an unwise decision, there was no malfeasance, do you get a response? Do you ever see anybody fired from your recommendations like that? We normally don't see anyone fired, and We've actually, in a couple of cases, recommended action be taken, and nothing happens. So you make formal recommendations sometimes on specific personnel that made a decision? Y yes, we have in the past. Okay. Um, and it's being pointed out exactly to the people who are in the, in the chain of command of making these decisions. A, a classic example, sir, was uh, we uncovered a, uh, a 64,000 square foot uh, headquarters that was being built in uh, Camp Leatherneck. Um, the, uh, I think it was $36 million approximately. Uh, the Marine Corps commander down there said, don't build it, I don't want it, we right. won't use it. His, his boss, General Allen, said, don't build it, I don't want it, we won't use it. But somebody, a general officer sitting behind the lines said, we have to spend it. We have to spend it because Congress gave us the money. So we wrote that up as uh, we thought it was gross negligence, and the Secretary of Defense at that time, not the current Secretary of Defense, basically said they didn't view that as an issue. I wonder if part of the answer might be in who gets your reports, that if you're giving it to a chain of command and they happen to be good friends and they have risen through the ranks together and they're unlikely to make the, the necessary personnel change, whether or not it's presenting the evidence maybe to a higher level, to a political appointee or to a supervisor at a two or three levels removed that isn't you know, working with the people involved with the decisions. Does, does that happen also? Well, we do wide distribution, uh, Mr. Chairman, of our reports, so I think politicals definitely see our reports also. All right. Um, and uh, how often are you doing these, like, in person? You know, how often would you come before, you know, if I'm the general and four levels beneath, beneath me made this decision on half a billion planes, would you have a time where you're sitting face-to-face -face with a general or a major general or an assistant secretary of defense or a secretary of defense and, and let them know about these things? 
Um, sometimes we try. They don't always uh, let us come in to brief them on that. Uh, but see, uh, see, I'm wondering right. if maybe that would be part of the solution. I can't just say, let's write an edict that people should be fired for bad decision. We should do that. But I'm wondering if maybe we could have legislation that would, um, re, you know, some, some people have to come once a year and testify here if perhaps maybe some of these reports need to be sort of that someone has to be designated to listen to it in person that ha that is in high up in the chain of command making procurement decisions, making purchasing decisions. Do you think that would work, or do you have any other suggestions on how we would make the system work better? Well, I, I think you need to change the culture and hold people accountable for it. If you don't hold people accountable for wasting money, they will continue to waste money. Right. And I think we see that throughout the U.S. government. I've, I've been looking at this since I started in 1982, uh, actually 1978, and people just are not held accountable for stupid decisions that waste taxpayers' money. So sometimes it works, but that you think it works when we get a good person that you get to who says we can't allow this to continue to happen. And so, you know, that sort of begs the question how to get more good people in government. But I think you've got to, in some ways, we have to look at some sort of mandatory way of having people listen to your information such that it gets to. And I think it has to be somewhat above the, the close part of the chain of command where you might be uh, socially uh, engaged with the people who are making, you know, who made the decision and unlikely to fire someone you're close to. Um, you know, there's a... Another argument as well that Friedman always made that nobody spends somebody else's money as wisely as their own. That's why you have more waste in government. It's mm -hmm. not your money. And so, you know, people are never going to be as good with it. I think there's truth to that. So government's never going to be very good, but it certainly shouldn't be as bad as, as we see government to be. But, but Mr. Chairman, can I, I just uh, allude to something? Uh, in one case, for example, yeah. from doing publicly disclosing our findings, uh, a, a good example is General Mattis, as Secretary of Defense, took one of our reports, it was a report on the camouflage uniforms, right. and basically sent a memo to every senior official in the Department of Defense saying, see this report, read it, don't ever do anything like this again. And that sends a message. Yeah, and I, I think, think so, but what I guess what I'm getting at is thinking of, and I don't think we have to say that the Secretary of Defense has to sit down with you or meet with you, but maybe an Assistant Secretary of Defense once a year should have to sit down with you and look at you across the desk and have a group of people with them, their staff and your staff, and actually listen to what you're saying, and, and maybe you'd get more results if we mandated such a meeting. Well, well there's no reason to mandate. We do that. I mean, okay. we meet with heads of agencies, and we tell them what we're finding, and we identify identify people. We do that on a regular basis. But again, I think I would clearly look at the process for removing people or uh, uh, penalizing them for these actions. I don't think there is something in place or a motivation to do that in many cases. Ms. Miller, on the narcotics, I, I think I got your point, but I think you could maybe expand on it a little bit. Um, it seemed to be that you were indicating that there were other forces so large that there wasn't an amount of money that would stop the the growth, grow, the growth of poppy and the distribution of poppy out of Afghanistan. If that's what you said, say yes. And if not, if it is what you said, expand upon what are those. I didn't really get what those forces are that are so big that, uh, you know, make it almost impossible to stop the narcotics trade. Yeah, I mean, some of it is just the sheer scale of the problem is enormous. Uh, some of it is that it's just an incredibly lucrative commodity. And so the economic dynamics that support the perpetuation of, uh, of the narcotics industry in Afghanistan are very powerful and are more powerful even than the $8 billion we spent on programs uh, to try to fight it. Um, there's also a problem of political will on the part of the Afghan government. I'm not saying there's no will, but uh, but 
it's not only the Taliban uh, and other uh, malign actors in Afghanistan who benefit from narcotics trafficking and production. It's also historically been people who are associated with the Afghan government. Uh, and so the, the political incentives as well to try to fight this right. um, are not as strong as they could be. Well, I think that's been the comment by some that, uh, you know, we blame it on them and we could also look in the mirror. If we didn't want to buy it, they wouldn't sell it. Or if there wasn't a yeah. demand, there wouldn't be a supply. And I think it's important, though, but I, I think it's important to highlight sort of the, uh, I guess, the degree of... Um, you know, not believing that something will be done is, is an important one to know before we, because if we're making policy decisions, we could spend $16 billion, which gets back to Senator Jones' point a little bit on how do we do better oversight. Well, we could. We could spend billions of dollars more, and we could have armed escorts to every one of the projects we're spending money on. So it's either we keep spending the money, and we spend more money to send armed troops to look at it, or maybe we reevaluate whether we should spend the money there or, or here at home. Um, I have no more questions, and we're probably going to end the panel, but I'm going to go to Senator Peters and anybody else that has a question before we finish up the panel. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. And just to pick up on the point, Ms. Miller, uh, when it comes to the uh, opioid uh, or the opium production in Afghanistan, you mentioned the, the Taliban engaged, but there are others. It's um, my recollection in my trip to Afghanistan that as big as the amount that the Taliban is producing, it's a very large amount, but it's a relatively small fraction of the total amount that's that's produced in the country. The numbers were were overwhelming. There are folks outside the Taliban that are profiting to a considerable extent as a result of this uh, production. But I want to get my question uh, is uh, is in reference to a letter that was sent to the subcommittee by Andrew Wilder from the U.S. Institute of Peace, and he references uh, the Goldilocks approach to aid funding, uh, and he argues uh, in the letter. Uh, that I would like to enter into the record, if I may, without objection, uh, that too much money for civilian and military reconstruction and stabilization programs during the period of the troop surge was a major factor promoting waste, fraud, and abuse. But he goes on to argue, sharply reducing to too little assistance within too short a time frame would likely lead to state collapse in Afghanistan in a catastrophic way. Ms. Miller, would, uh, would you like to comment on that approach? I largely agree with that. In, in the written testimony that I submitted, I made the point that uh, time is probably more valuable than money in Afghanistan. I think it's definitely a problem that we pushed out too much money too fast at the height of the surge, and that led not only to uh, waste and abuse, but it led to uh, poor, uh, poor planning. Uh, and really, I, I can't say that I know anyone who was responsible for spending that money um, who didn't feel that it was too much money too fast and it created bad incentives on the U.S. government side. It created bad incentives on the Afghan uh, side as well. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, look, I mean, the, the dollars that we're spending have been declining, uh, and I think that's appropriate. Um, but to go, uh, you know, dramatically down from where we are now to precipitously, I think, would jeopardize our own national security interests. It has come up. Um, one final question, because I know the chairman wants to get to the second uh, panel here, but one final question is that, uh, as we've discussed uh, with the, the extent of the corruption that we see with the Afghan government in, in executing uh, these contracts and not uh, seemingly meeting any of the expectations that we have for them, there has been discussion of entering into contracts with the Afghan government on the principle of conditionality, where you have to you don't receive funding unless certain conditions uh, are met uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, outputs. I'd like both of you to comment briefly. Uh, is that something we should explore? What are the positives? What are the negatives? And what has been done currently, and what should we do differently? Oh, I, I think that's a very important point. Uh, and we didn't really uh, have good conditions, and, and more importantly, enforce those conditions until recently. I remember talking to General Seminite when he ran c Sticker, the Combined Security Transition Command, command two, or th two years ago. And he said DOD put no conditions up to that time. Wow. It was only when he took over that he started putting conditions. So that's what you got to do. If you talk to President Ghani, I was just there two weeks ago, he says, give me conditions. If you give me real conditions, I can use it to enforce my ministers to do the right thing. And I think you can see this right now with what you did in the appropriations bill. 
you basically passed a law ordering us to assess the Afghanistan anti-corruption strategy and its implementation. And although I can't tell you the results of that audit, it's going to be done in another month, we have seen tremendous efforts on behalf of the Afghans to get their act together because they're afraid the appropriators are going to cut the budget. That's smart conditionality. I agree wholeheartedly, Senator. You, we need to do that. We need to enforce it. We have to be able to risk saying no to the Afghans and cutting funds if necessary. Ms. Miller. I hate to be even less optimistic than John Sofko, um, but uh, <laughs> I may have lost some friends there. Um, but look, conditionality is an important tool. It's a tool that the U.S. has been use, using increasingly in Afghanistan and other donors as well. But it is no panacea, and there are two real limitations to using conditionality. One is a practical limitation. Who are you motivating by by imposing conditionality. If there are Afghan officials uh, or people connected with them who are prepared to steal from the public coffers, they are not going to be motivated not to steal from the public coffers because the US government is withholding funds. And so you may be providing some motivation to some of the good actors, but you're not incentivizing the bad actors. The second problem is a policy one. We've entered into a mutual dependency with the Afghan government government because of the nature of our strategy in Afghanistan. We're giving the Afghan government this money because we've judged it to be within U.S. national security interests to have a stable government, and it has been judged necessary to give them this assistance in order to promote their stability. Therefore, if we reduce that assistance uh, as a matter of conditionality, we're undermining our own security. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't do it to some extent, but that, uh, you know, we've tied our, our own hands behind our back in terms of using conditionality because of the nature of the, the policy and the strategy that we have in the country. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks for joining us, and keep up the good work. We're going to go to our second panel now. Thank you, and I'd like to welcome our second panel. Our second panel is Greg McNeil and Sergio Gore. At the behest of this subcommittee, they recently participated in a bipartisan staff delegation to Afghanistan to conduct oversight of federal spending. Mr. McNeil has served on the FSO subcommittee majority staff since 2015 and as staff director for one year. Prior to joining the FSO subcommittee, Mr. McNeil spent eight years as a budget analyst on the Senate Budget Committee. Additionally, he served as the minority staff director for the Senate Budget Committee Task Force on Government Performance from 2009 to 2015. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Oregon and a master's of public administration from Central Michigan University. Mr. McNeil, you are recognized for your opening statement. and Cigar for making this fact-finding mission possible. Most important, I want to recognize the soldiers who've served and sacrificed in Afghanistan, particularly those that have given their lives. Over two and a half days, our bipartisan team participated in approximately 12 meetings with personnel on the ground and four site visits at various locations in Kabul and at Bagram Air Base. I would say that we barely scratched the surface. The first thing I want to report is that we were told repeatedly that this was only the second congressional oversight mission to Afghanistan, whereas appropriators and authorizers go roughly every 10 days. If you do the math, that's one in about 150 trips. 
Uh, that means that congressional oversight is at a decided disadvantage to congressional spenders. I'm going to highlight just a few things that we saw while we were there. <clears throat> First, uh, um, the U.S. efforts to provide uh, electricity to the Afghan people, and second, uh, U.S. Uh, demilitarization and disposal of property. First, we investigated the Northeast power system uh, and really the entire electrification effort in Afghanistan. In 2001, roughly 6% of the Afghan population had power. Today, that number is over 30%, and we're aiming for full electrification by 2020. But this effort, which is expected to cost about $750 million, is riddled with problems. To begin with, we're building towers on people's land without getting their permission first. Let me pause there. I shouldn't say we're building these. Uh, because though U.S. dollars can go to these locations, U.S. personnel cannot because of safety concerns. So we're trusting contractors to do it for us. Nonetheless, this electric grid is, be grid is being built. Uh, and though it doesn't even meet the standards of the contracts that we're writing, eventually it's turned over to the Afghan Power Authority. Last year, the Afghan Power Authority reported a net loss of $23.4 million. Now this could be for a couple of reasons. One could be that the Taliban keeps blowing up their transmission towers. Uh, we assume it's the Taliban and not the uh, landowner who woke up one day to find a tower in his backyard. Nonetheless, these are getting blown up, <clears throat> sometimes uh, dozens of times. Now, U.S. officials think that this is still a success because the Afghan Power Authority is now very accomplished at rebuilding towers and restringing line. We were told a couple times it's done in hours now, whereas before it was done in days. Of course, this ignores the wasted money we spent building the original tower, uh, and we still, through various means, provide funding to the Afghan Electric Authority. The end result is the same. Um, either the power authority eventually pays the Taliban a bribe to stop blowing up the towers, or the Taliban just takes over the towers and then charges the local population. Uh, this apparently is seen as a success. The other item I want to talk about is a project this committee has been working on for four years. Uh, several years ago, we heard from a whistleblower that brand new, never used equipment and vehicles was being destroyed in industrial shredders in Afghanistan. We've been asking about this for years, four years in fact, uh, and we keep getting told that either it isn't happening at all or it's just extremely rare. So we went to the facility at Bagram Air Base to see for ourselves. And we saw a lot of worn out equipment uh, being shredded in industrial shredders. But you can imagine how surprised we were after being told that this wasn't happening, uh, walking into a warehouse and finding three large bins full of brand new electrical equipment, breaker boxes, breakers and such, still in their original packaging. <clears throat> now we do know that uh, during the drawdown, the US uh, scrapped roughly $7 billion worth of military equipment. And we've been told repeatedly that um, the cost, um, um, well, we've been told that uh, there was a lot of waste during the early part of the war. Um, and then, of course, during the drawdown. Uh, we heard that in the first panel that there was, you know, significant, um, uh, you know, a blank check. Uh, but these things that I'm reporting on here right now are not old items. Uh, three weeks ago, there were brand new breaker boxes ready to be shredded in an industrial shredder. Right now, we're building towers and they're being blown up. Um, so this is not uh, a problem that has been solved. Uh, and this gets back to my original point. Oversight in Washington is much different than oversight on the ground. And on the ground oversight cannot be a one in 150 affair. Uh, let me close with this. Oversight does not compromise the mission, as some have argued, in Afghanistan or, frankly, anywhere else in the government. Tough questions and consequences condition and strengthen us. Moreover, they force us to assess the merits or lack of merits of what the government does. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Our next witness is Sergio Gore. Mr. Gore currently serves as my Deputy Chief of Staff for Communications. In this capacity, he oversees staff and communications department, coordinates on matters of foreign policy, and administers special projects for the office. Prior to joining my staff, Mr. Gore worked as a producer at Fox News Channel and as a communications director in the U.S. House of Representatives. 
Mr. Gore holds a double major in international affairs and political science from George Washington University. Mr. Gore. Thank you for holding this hearing. Um, I'd like to start by expressing our gratitude <coughs> um, for all those that hosted us on the ground, the embassy, especially Ambassador Bass, the DCM, all the security and personnel that were involved. A uh, specific thank you to Cigar and um, IG Sopko for his incredible work and the work they do. Um, with that, I'll jump straight into it, and I'd like to highlight some of the things that we actually saw. And I believe we got some photos um, to go along with it. The first project that we visited um, was nicknamed the Kabul Marriott. This project was started 11 years ago, and it was initiated with a $60 million loan from OPEC. Um, the building was supposed to be completed several years ago, and unfortunately, there was almost no oversight. And one of the things that we saw over and over again on this trip is good intentions gone bad. So when this building started being built, the only oversight consisted of the contractor submitting pictures back to headquarters back to the United States. The one thing that I must mention is this building's about 400 feet from the US Embassy. We have 7,000 personnel there. This was a $60 million project, and nobody went over there to look at it that it was not completed. The updates would say it's ready for opening in two months, at best, this building, in our opinion, is at 30% completion. In addition to that, because this building was going so great, um, they decided to fund an adjacent building for 30 more million. So now we're in 90 million in the hole. Nothing's been completed. This building has become a security threat to the point where we must provide 24-hour service um, protection because it is so close um, to the embassy. The State Department in indicated to us that they're now acquiring this land with the ultimate goal of tearing down the building completely for security reasons. Um, the next project I'd like to highlight is the Ministry of Interior. And this, is, this was a nice building from the outside. We spent $210 million building it. Um, one of the things, one of the rumors that we persistently heard was that the former minister was not happy with the lack of um, marble that, that was inside of this ministry. And he compared himself to the defense minister of Afghanistan and said, well, if this guy has it, I surely want it too. Um, while we're not able to verify exactly if those were his words, we did find $2.6 million in a follow-up um, upgrade, and that specifically included um, marble work. Um, additionally, as you look at the line items for this building, $7,000 was billed for lost time waiting for instructions. So people standing around not being told what to do. $10,000 was billed for a car and driver. Um, and you'd think with $210 million, we'd get something that would at least function. However, when we got a tour of the building on the inside from local Afghan staff that worked there, they pointed to one thing after another, including air conditioning units that don't work, fire doors that don't meet certification requirements, fire sprinkler systems that are not even connected to anything. Um, and one interesting thing that we found in the billing um, of this building, there was actually an item listed as disconnect the fire alarm system. Um, those are the two main projects I, that, um, that I, I'd like to highlight. However, two other points I'd like to make. Corruption. Corruption's a massive problem. Every meeting that I attended, one of the points that I'd ask was, what percentage do you think disappears due to corruption, waste, fraud, or abuse? And that number ranged anywhere from 20% to as high as 50%. Um, countless stories. The Kabul Bank, which was headed by former President Karzai's brother, ran, basically ran a Ponzi scheme, defrauded close to a billion dollars, and almost no accountability. One thing we kept hearing over and over again, it's part of the way things are here. Um, there's a internationally recognized group, Transparency International, and one of the things they put out is a corruption perception index. And in last year's ranking, they ranked Afghanistan as 177th out of 180 in terms of corruption. So the only people ahead of them, are, I believe, are Somalia and Syria. Um, and my last point that I'll make is something we kept hearing both from our sides and the Afghan side, and that is Afghans that are leaving Afghanistan. They call it a brain drain. Um, after contacting the State Department here, 
the number that we've received is 51,000 have moved to the United States. These are educated individuals. These are individuals that went to school, whether it's in Europe or in the United States, and they're not contributing back to their local um, nations. Um, that their president has actually been pretty good on this, and I quote, he said, I have no sympathy for these people. They should remain and join efforts in rebuilding their own, our own home. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you both for your testimony. Uh, Mr. McNeil, when you were talking about in your testimony, you, I think you were talking about oversight when you said only one in 150. Uh, you were referring to only one out of 150 projects have oversight, or what was your No, no, point? no. Um, one in 150 trips, uh, either by members or staff are from Congress, oversight. are oversight. The remainder are, particular, are generally uh, authorizers or appropriators. Do you have an estimate on of the projects, what percentage of the projects are able to have oversight? You know, you've talked about, and the previous panel talked about, because of the safety concerns, not being able to actually go to the sites of some of these projects. 10% getting visually seen, 20%? I don't have an exact number, but I imagine that that's even probably a, a rosy figure. Uh, we asked to go see the gas station. Uh, we were told that was unsecure. That's uh, Mr. Sopko testified to that. Many of these projects we can't even, um, U.S. personnel can't go to when they're being built, let alone oversight conducted. Uh, the electric grid, um, I looked up the distances. Uh, at one point, it's 13 miles from Bagram Air Base. Uh, where our largest U.S. presence is. We can't go 13 miles from there to look at a project that we're spending money on. All right. Well, you know, when looking at how we figure out the solutions, you know, people are saying, well, we can spend more going to the sites. But I think that sort of begs the question. The, the Marriott was 400 feet from the embassy, so, I mean, it's, it's still within the compound, right? Or it's on the outside, so there is a outside, wall separating. You can walk up. across the street. However, um, there is a closed street that, um, that is not open to traffic. So it's, there's different parameters, um, perimeters, and it's on one of the outer perimeters, but it's close enough that everybody passes it every day. Right. So that sort of begs the question that that's not a lack of access. Everybody's, in fact, seeing it's sort of a big Correct. eyesore that it's not been finished, and I believe it's been 11 years since it was right. started. And so I think these are the bigger, broader questions we face in this is that government's full of waste. Do we try to fix the waste? Sure, we should try to make, you know, where there's less wasteful spending. But the question is, is it possible uh, really to eliminate the waste, or do we need to readdress where the resources are going, whether they should go to Afghanistan or whether they should remain here at home. With regard to the uh, Ministry of the Interior, you said it was $210 million, and the $2 million were referred to an upgrade in marble? Correct. So there was a refurbishment, they called it, of 2.4, I believe, um, which was in addition to the 210 initial investment. Right. Um, to build the building from scratch. And, and do you think the contractors here are local or um, the... So one, one point to make on that refurbishment, the refurbishment was paid by NATO with some of our funds. So while we paid the initial 210, the 2.4 was divided, um, just for full disclosure. Um, usually, so they would, they would put out bids um, for all these projects, whether it's the Marriott, um, it varies. Um, the Marriott was by Jordanians. Um, there, we saw some contracts by Tunisians. We saw a lot of, um, there were some local contracts also. With the uh, question uh, related to what, hundreds and hundreds of doors not being fireproofed, you would think that then, then we're looking at not just uh, waste but malfeasance if they didn't give them exactly what they ordered. Absolutely, and not only that, people get upcharged. So we pay a certain amount and hundreds of dollars for a fireproof door that is supposed to sustain 30, 40 minutes of a fire so people are able to get out. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we get skimmed. Um, and this happened not in just at, at the Ministry of Interior, but in multiple, multiple other locations that we heard about that we weren't able to visit, but it's an ongoing problem. There's too much money, there's no oversight, and no one is held responsible. Mr. McNeil, we talked about having conditions in contracts, sort of conditions of behavior, but I guess you can also condition contracts, um, you know, based on performance, People talk about government contracts being uh, cost plus and people just adding and adding and adding to cost. Um, is there an example of government where we do contracts that you think works better, contracts that have incentives uh, either for completion or for quality or ways that we can uh, have oversight through, you know, the fact that you don't get your money unless you do your job, et cetera? 
Yeah, sure. Um, it's not a federal example, but uh, after the San Francisco earthquake, uh, the, uh, the Bay Bridge was rebuilt on a uh, performance contract, and it was built ahead of schedule and under budget because the contractor uh, would get an incentive for doing so. Uh, that's something we could certainly do here in the federal government. But I wanted to point out, um, these contracts, the projects aren't meeting the standards of even the contracts we're writing. And what we've seen is where they rewrite the contracts. With the fire doors, um, they, um, they notice these aren't the right fire doors. These don't have the right labeling on them. Cigar pointed this out to the Army Corps of Engineers. And so the Army Corps of Engineers sent an email to the contractor saying, we're accepting what you're doing now as meeting the terms of the contract. Stick a different label on it? Basically, yeah. <laughs> the... Um with the previous panel, we talked a little bit about getting the system to work. How do you get people to be held accountable for their decisions? And we talked a little bit about the inspector generals being, there are some, I guess, that DOD has, and then there's some that are more traditional inspector generals that report to Congress. Uh, Mr. McNeil, do you have an opinion on ways to get the advice to be listened to or acted upon, getting rid of bad people who make bad decisions, how we would do that better? or whether we should alter the inspector general program any uh, within DOD to make things better? Uh, well, certainly I think there should be reform with the inspector general process. Um, uh, you know, uh, Inspector General Sopko does an excellent job. Um, I've dealt with inspector generals over my entire career, and some of them are, you know, frankly, um, I would say in bed with their agency. Um, but I think this gets to a broader problem that uh, I think uh, Inspector General Sopko talked about is, um, you know, a lot of our, you know, it's, it's hard to fire people in government. A lot of times it's easier to just look the other way and not, uh, or transfer them or something like that, uh, or wait for their tenure in a place to be um, over. Uh, I mean, our personnel policy uh, was written in the 1880s. Uh, we're still basically operating off of the, uh, the Pendleton Act, which was created in response to the assassination of uh, President Garfield. Um, so I think it's probably time to update our personnel policy so that we can hold people accountable. Cigar, you hear about and has gotten notoriety for looking into waste in Afghanistan. Um, I don't recall as much notoriety with the Inspector General from DOD. Are, are we paying the same amount of attention to the Inspector General, the Independent Inspector General for the DOD? Um, I wouldn't say so. Um, the, their mission is different. Uh, the, Mr. Sopko made the point that he's the only one that has kind of cross-jurisdictional uh, capabilities to look at spending elsewhere. Uh, we do pay attention to some of it uh, that DOD talks about. For example, we've talked about the uh, 700, uh, it was a million or billion dollars in uh, um, ammunition purchases. Uh, that was a DOD uh, Inspector General report. Um, but. Well, I think as a, a future project from this is we ought to look at that and see how well it works, you know, and whether or not having two different sets of inspector generals, whether that's a problem, whether it could be consolidated, whether the one that they've had in place that it's reporting to DOD chain of command is useful or not useful, whether we should maybe have those resources directed more towards the inspector general office uh, that is independent or reports to Congress. And I think there are some reforms. I think that and trying to figure out um, ways that we can uh, waste less money within this system and incentives that we can change. Um, but with that, I think we're going to close the hearing unless you have a final comment from either one of you. I, I just, I think what Inspector General Sopko does and what Cigar does, going back to your previous question is, He's not afraid to rock the boat. And one thing that we kept hearing over and over again is the cigar team in Kabul is not welcome, even among other Americans on base. And because they show up and they don't take any prisoners, and I, as Mr. McNeil mentioned, some of the other inspector generals, they're from that branch, they're from that department. They have to see these people, they have to live with them. So I think the more independence, the better. I think this makes a strong argument for looking at the inspector general process within DOD because you need to have independence and you need to have people who are unafraid uh, to do this. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. And the hearing is adjourned.